So for the past 16 years, um, I've been with the, the Coast Guard. Uh, duties in the Navy, I would have been, I would have served on most of the vessels around there, from the minesweepers right through to Edna, right down up through uh, Kira and Roisin. Uh, didn't serve on any of the newer vessels. Um, would have been involved in a few search and rescue uh, missions with them at the time, especially the one, the Carrigan Time, which off Donegal, where we spent three weeks up off the, the north coast. Uh, that was a fishing vessel went down uh, in the early 80s uh, with the loss of uh, six lives. Um, that's probably primarily the first time I, I was involved in search and rescue on a major scale, apart from the Air India. We did do have a small bit to do with the Air India. We were out on the Etna. Um, and we did have the American company out there at the time and, and we did find the signal from the black box when we handed over to the EFA where it was eventually recovered off the black box was eventually poured off the Air India. Uh, so that was quite uh, quite a busy busy one. Realistically, I'm going to talk to you about incidents about from the Coast Guard, the, and more the operational side, I'm not going to talk too much about the technical, although I will touch, I will touch on some of the technical uh, bits and pieces we have available, especially during the maritime domain and awareness. But uh, I think primarily it is just to give you an overview of what the Coast Guard does, and then we will talk about some of the incidents that have happened, um, some of the major incidents, and I'll give you a Coast Guard view of those. Uh, to be primarily my view, um, there may not be an official view, but it will be my view. Uh, I'll be as honest as I can with you. Um, I, will tell, I will give you some insights into what happens on, on incidents, um, which you might find uh, interesting. So it, it will differ from the reports that you read in the press, etc. Just as a general uh, opener for the, you know, around the coast, what the, what, the, what you call it, what trying what the maritime picture really is. If we're looking at it right, you know, and it doesn't get too much uh, publicity in the press, because we, get, we do tend to get a, a raw press. I mean, if even if you own I, I, our department, or our section, the Irish Coast Guard, we're in the Irish Maritime Administration side of the part of the house in the Department of Transport. And we really are the sort of, we are the, the third wheel in there, you know I mean? Aviation, you know, is very is the is the primary one. You know, that's the one that gets all the publicity. That's the one that gets that will get all the attention. Roads, lots of attention. But even within our own department, uh, you'll see maritime. It really is sort of we are a poor relation, and that is quite amazing when you actually look at it. I mean, ninety percent of what we trade in the country is carried through our ports, <coughs> it's carried through our maritime fleet, it's carried through trade, etc. You can see the figures there, um, you know, bulk, uh, bulk traffic was up to 29, 9.5 million tonnes. Um, I'll just point you down to the, the low traffic, or the low low traffic is fed, the feeder vessels, the sub 2000 TEUs. Um, that's an important figure, keep that in your head, I'll be referring back to that. When we talk about uh, when we we're trying to connect up a few of the the incidents around the coast um, and what the future for um, maritime incidents around the country will we will see in the future. You can see that there's an increase in the number of cruise ships that are out there, 246 uh, mm -hmm. for the call last year, um, and you can see the shipping index. The I ship index, which is uh, has started to come up a small bit, although it still is it is off the 2007 um, reached um, the, the, the high point reached in 2007, and this is all in the what you call it in the in the report from um, the uh, Irish Maritime Domain Awareness. What <coughs> we are talking about an incident or major maritime incident. That is from uh, a report on the MV Rena. Now the MV Rena was a small container vessel which went down off New Zealand and we will touch on it again later on. It was only 1,360 odd containers. But the interesting thing, that happened about 
12 to 14 kilometres off the coast. And this is a report written, and I would encourage anybody who has an interest in maritime affairs, uh, and if they want to see what can happen to a country, or what the effect of a, of a casualty is. And Murdoch is making the point that a major ship's casualty right, is both an industrial and a natural disaster. That happened in 2011. They are still dealing with that incident today. Look at our old shipping routes around the country. There's no surprise to think anybody in the room. Most of you will, sit, will know exactly where the major ports, Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Waterford, you know, and they're going to expect the major shipping routes. So primarily if we do have a major casualty, they are going to be down along those sort of areas. That's where we would expect them to, ha to happen. Let's look at our SAR region to what the Coast Guard are responsible for when we think of search and rescue. Just bear this in mind, they, these uh, come from the IAMSAR, uh, they're internationally agreed. Um, they go approximately 200 miles off the coast. We're divided down into three areas, Malin, Valencia and the Dublin, Dublin regions. Um, they're mainly set up primarily to do in the past with the, with the flight paths that came across. So these were agreed when Ireland probably wasn't as well developed um, in relation to resource-wise during, the, during the, the 60s, 70s, 80s. You can see that there's a large chunk gone off the, the top end. Now, you might say, well, do we carry out rescues there? Yes, we do. The majority of rescues that are carried out in that North Clyde area would be carried out by the Coast Guard. Um, and the resources and any re other resources that we have in the area. A lot of the inland SAR in Northern Ireland, that is carried out by our, our own Coast Guard helicopters. A lot of the transplants, a lot of those uh, um, international uh, organ donations which are taking place, especially in Northern Ireland, especially in the Southern Ireland, they would take place on our Coast Guard helicopters. Um, just keep that in mind just when we, when we talk a bit more and then we look at Ireland's EEZ. You can see that area has substantially increased much further out. So our EEZ area that we're looking at is much bigger and it's, much more, uh, it's a much larger area that we are responsible for. These are important because we will talk about the resources that Ireland actually devote, uh, devotes to them. I show you this now in 2006, you might say, well, why is he showing me 2006? I show you this in 2006 because just look at the numbers. If we look at our station staff, right, down below, we have Dublin, Man and Valencia, which are our radio stations. We have 46 station staff. Since 2006, we are now down to 40. We have lost uh, the deputy division controllers at that level. If you see across in our uh, pollution and salvage, we had a manager and three operation and training officers who, who do the pollution and ship's casualty side. We are now down to one officer in that area. So what I'm telling you is that uh, the Coast Guard, like every other part of the public service, has taken a brunt of the resources. And the ability of the Coast Guard to respond to incidents, to manage incidents in the future, will be impacted by these resources. That's just a, uh, what you call it, a view of our Maritime Operations Centre in Dublin. We have three. We have uh, the MRCC Dublin, we have one in Valencia, and we also have one in Malin. Um, each centre there can operate on its own. Each centre can operate together in twos or in threes. So that the idea is that if one centre goes down, that uh, another centre can pick up the slack and manage the incidents uh, around the coast. The Coast Guard itself, we have a number of sections as I showed you. We have the, the search and rescue side, which primarily comprises of the, uh, the, the centre, which is Manon, Valencia and Dublin. We have the voluntary services and training side, and this looks after our volunteers around the coast. So you can see we have approximately 46 uh, stations around the coast. Some of these stations have been amalgamated. 
All our units are primarily a search unit. Some of the units are boat units, some are cliff units. Uh, we have about approximately 19 uh, climbing units and approximately 21 boat units uh, on it. And some of the units would be two would, would do two functions, and some of them some of the units would be capable of doing three functions. That's just some of the, the activities that are carried out. You can see the just the climbing activities. Um, we have upgraded our what you call it our helicopter fleet. We were operating with the old ones with the S62s. Uh, we've gone for the uh, 91s there, and uh, the Sikorskys. Um, they are a much bigger, a much better model. Um, approximately five, four years ago, we went from sort of just doing it on a four-year contract um, with uh, with the helicopters. We've now put in a plan that, it will, that uh, the contract lasts for ten years. So over that, we will spend approximately five hundred uh, million euro uh, providing the service. The service uh, we have four bases. We have Dublin, Waterford, Shannon, and we have uh, Sligo. Um, the helicopters are on uh, 24 hour, 365 day a year, and each base has one helicopter, and there is one helicopter supposed to be in on standby to take over if they go down. Generally, we manage to do have all four, sometimes we, we are down to three. The good thing about the, the new helicopter is that it has a greater range and it has a greater time on scene and it is, electronics wise, it is much better um, than, the, than the old helicopter. The, we just carried out uh, a rescue off the coast, 320 kilometres off the coast where we took off uh, an injured crewman off the, uh, the northwest um, just about three weeks ago. That was quite, uh, quite a good uh, a good rescue that far out. So that just tells you the range. The range in the, the what you call it, the range in the contract was for the helicopter to go out 200 kilometers, spend 45 minutes on scene, and then return to base. But actually, it is being extended, it is going out much further. Um, one of the things we have is that the helicopter now, because it is not so much now a, in Prior to this contract, it was looking out much more to sea. Uh, now the helicopter is looking a lot more into land. It's carrying out a lot more work for the traffic accidents. It's carrying out a lot more work in relation to uh, patient transfer. Um, it is part of the, the, the what you call it, the National Ambulance Centre can actually call on the helicopter now to take patients around the country, etc. And it does a lot of work carrying uh, patients across the UK. Um, okay. Now, managing a response to a major shipping incident or a pollution. We basically uh, uh, go along the, the lineup of a Tier 1, Tier 2 and a Tier 3. A Tier 1 response, right, each local authority or each um, facility, let's call it uh, an oil producer or an oil refinery, etc. That should have its own tier one response. So the, the company itself has to have in place a capability to manage an incident within its own within its own environment. That, is, that uh, capability should be enough to to stop an incident in uh, happening to manage it for the first four to five hours. If it's not able to manage that, it then goes to a tier two, and that's at a local region, and that's at a regional response. The, each of the coastal counties has its own plans. It has a limited amount of equipment to manage, uh, to manage an incident. If it's what you call it, if it becomes more than the local authority or the regional can manage, they're supposed to manage it, they're supposed to then call the Coast Guard and then it escalates up to a tier three. Now, to manage a tier three, we have three stockpiles. We have a stockpile in Blanchestown, we have a stockpile in Castletown, and we have a stockpile in Killy Beggs. That is what happens if it is 
on the land. If it is now at sea, the Coast Guard will coordinate and direct all the responses. And we have various assets to call on. We have our own helicopters. We have uh, equipment uh, that we have within the, the national response, the national tier response. Uh, we can call on uh, international response. So therefore, we will go across to the likes of the UK. We will go to the likes of France. We will go to the likes of Norway, Sweden to get some uh, to get some equipment from them. The shoreline cleanup. That is. Uh, that is the responsibility of the local authorities. The legislation states that it is to, to be coordinated and directed by the Coast Guard. We do not have the personnel involved in the Coast Guard to actually do that. Um, primarily, um, we will go to, we have one officer, that's it. But at that stage, uh, primarily it will be managed under the National Framework for Emergency Management. And that can be taken off the website mem.ie. Just some of the incidents that we would look at and be taken into account. You know, if you look at some of the incidents that happened in 2014, there was three three sinkings. Um, they were all taken up. There were fishing vessels that sank. Uh, a couple of them sank off Ross Lair. Um, they were all taken out. Uh, in the what you call it, in quick succession. Uh, we had five towages. Um, some of them were quite large. The Helsingport Charger, um, that was carrying 20,000 tonnes of um, sulfuric acid. Uh, that needed a tow, that was down off Limerick, uh, down off Fines area. The MV Cape Elisa, she was on the northwest. Um, she was a 300, uh, 300 metre vessel. She was travelling uh, across to, to what you call it, travelling to the coal carrier, travelling to Clyde. Uh, bad weather. She took five, uh, five tugs to tow her through the, through the, through the weather, etc. And this is happening uh, off the coast. And each of these has the potential to become a major, major disaster. Some of the groundings that we look at, there's nothing really of major interest there. Um, the EMSA report, yeah, we have a uh, satellite, EMSA is the European Maritime Safety Agency and it will, uh, it will send us reports, it has satellites flying around, um, we get approximately 31, um, 31 tours every month, so the satellite will tour the, the, the what you call it, our seagoing area, It'll do 31 passes in our area, and if there's any pollution report or any kind of unusual interest in it, we'll get a report in about that. Now, but all this brings us down to the one to the one area that we're all trying to uh, to what you call it. We're all trying to grab a handle on, and I just show you that that's uh, that's one of the EMSA reports that came into us on the 14th of February 2009. Um, what we're trying to do is to build up. Uh, a marine domain is awareness picture, okay, and it all it all ties back down to providing a safe environment for the maritime shipping to operate. And um, this one you can see uh, the EMSA satellite had identified uh, a number of possible areas that we should be interested in. Um, that one, uh, that that's just the the report came in. And it said, Ireland, you have there's something happening in your area. You need to go out and you need to check this out. So, what do we get in some of the functions that we have in our what to call it in our uh, in our centres? And each of them have to be involved in this. There's uh, environmental casualty response. There's a patient network for our uh, our units, search and rescue, our comms, etc. Right. Um, we also provide a uh, place of refuge. Um, this is a new concept and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit as we, as we go through and you'll see when we talk about the incidents, the place of refuge that are, uh, as we're going through. Some of the tools that we use to, to, uh, to provide that picture, we have uh, what you call it, the integrated maritime data environment, right? That is provided by EMSA. That's all the uh, pictures from the radar from the satellite. 
uh, radio communications, ships that are, that are coming in, they're, they're providing information, they, they have to provide information into the centres, into all the centres coming into Europe. It all comes into the AI on that system. That AI on the system then is fed, fed back out to each of the member states. So we get that information and we use that uh, to build up our picture. We have our own GIS models, we have our tidal uh, algorithms, we have our own, we have the decision support software, we have our uh, oil map, we have our SAR map, so we can work off those. Um, we have CFCs, we got our hazmat reports coming in. And we also have our own national and international databases as well. Uh, so we use all of that. And then of course, private, a lot of where the information comes uh, into us is our own 112 system, 999. That's remember there's a public ringing in and they're providing alerts, they're providing information that there's a, an incident happening somewhere in the co around the coast. And that's just a picture of the AIS map that the lads will see up above, uh, just giving information uh, of the vessels which are around Ireland at the time. You know, they can go on to each one of those, they get the information in relation to it. Uh, it'll give you the information where it's going, uh, where its next port is, what country it's come from. Um, some of, the, some of them, if they have a problem, they'll, they'll flag up that they'll need to be uh, port state controlled, that information will go to the surveyors, etc. So all this information is just coming in and it's just been turned around and it's just been managed. As I said, uh, so the, the sources of information that are coming in to EMSA, and you can see it's going around, <coughs> the vessels are coming in, there's satellite information coming in, they're getting information from radar, um, to get information from uh, coastal stations and all that information is going into, into MZ and then it's being fed out to the national authorities and the national authorities vice versa are feeding their information into MZ and back around again. So it's, it's and why are we doing all this? Well the reason is this integrated maritime system right, feeds into a national picture for uh, the EU. Right? And that goes across all the areas of the EU. There is safety in the environment, there's fisheries, there's anti-piracy, border control, there's the coordination, and then again, there is the illicit drug trafficking that, uh, that, that's there. So Europe are doing this on a cooperative basis, and this really is, uh, it, this has moved on from sort of member states looking after their own little partnership, to really you have to embrace that we are part of Europe, um, and that this information, the more information you feed in, the better picture that the whole of Europe gets. Now, I don't know whether Brexit will have any, uh, what you call it, any breakdown in this, because if the UK come out of this, this is, uh, this would be a difficulty for Ireland, um, especially in relation to the information. EMSA, the European Maritime Safety Agency, that is funded by contributions from member states. So Ireland pays in a, in part of the fund. If the UK don't pay, don't pay in their section and they don't provide information that's in their area, where does that leave Ireland's picture? Our, our picture then starts to, to become uh, a little a little less a little less uh, coherent than it should be. So these are all areas that we just have to think about uh, on it. You will hear a lot, you know, talking about, um, you know, industry. You'll hear a lot talking about uh, agriculture. Yet, I would encourage you, when your representatives turn up, you make sure you talk to them about the maritime picture. Don't let them away with the light one, right? Because it is important that the maritime picture, the maritime services, the maritime transport, that is not forgotten. Because it will be forgotten. Okay? Uh, history shows us that it was forgotten. It was forgotten in 1972 when we joined the European Union and fisheries got a raw deal. Okay, so it is important that, uh, that, we, uh, that the maritime community actually engages with the politicians and tells them that this is something that has to be safeguarded and they have to put a, a bit of thought into it. Okay. Right. Let's start off on the incidents. Okay, if we go back 1979, um, you can see, right, th this is probably the first major maritime casualty that makes a major impact. 
and a very sad one it was too. Um, the better just thank her right. She was a South African total uh, ship coming in. Uh, it had approximately 114,000 ton of fuel on board to be offloaded. Uh, you can see it was 70, there was 74, 75,000 tons of Arabian heavy crew, and there was 40,000 tons of light crew. Um, it had loaded, or sorry, it had offloaded the, 70, the 74 tons uh, at the time, and there was 40,000 tons of Arabian light crewed, which were left on board at the time. Um, there was a fire. Reasons for uh, the fire are still are still being debated. Um, sadly, 49, 50 people lost their lives. Uh, very unfortunate. The whole crew, 42 of the crew, died, and I think there was seven, seven or eight, uh, what you call it, people, died died from uh, the port. Um, it was what you call it. It had a it had a profound effect because uh, it took approximately a year to clean up that. Cork County Council were responsible for the, the area at the time. They had they cleaned up the, the area. Um, luckily, the explosions that happened that didn't affect the 18 storage tanks that were on the island. Uh, they were very lucky uh, on it. Uh, although bits of machinery and bits of uh, debris and metal were found within the, the, the farm itself, uh, they didn't penetrate any of the storage tanks. It was approximately two weeks before there was, uh, it was cool enough for um, anyone to get in to, to go on to the, around the vessel to start offloading it. Um, as I said, it took approximately a year. Uh, the, the, the bow was taken out first. Uh, there was about 35 tons of dispersant dropped by plane uh, at the time on the area. Um, the what do you call it? And it it took uh, I think about about 120 million was was believed to have been cost it, it cost it. So that was the sort of the, the salvage cost 120 million dollars uh, on it. Putting that into perspective, um, you know, when you're looking at the, the, the what you call it, the cost of Concordia, I think it was it's somewhere up around 1.2 billion. Um, you know, Napoli, I think, is around 500 billion. So, you know, it, it's what you call it, it's comparative uh, in, in some of those. Now, Kowloon Bridge, coming back 1986. Um, people will start to remember a bit uh, about this one um, because it got a lot of publicity at the time. Uh, in '86, um, the weather, the, the, the weather systems, it was quite unusual at, at that time because um, the what you call it, there was a that month in November, there was uh, just an uncanny block of low depressions just came through, swept the country at the time and you know you get a lull but then you were back up into another force, seven, eight, nine, back up and back out again and then it went back into force ten, back out again and it was just just absolutely, uh, there was about two, two, three months, six weeks, eight weeks of just constant depression, southwesterly depressions coming through the, the country at the time and uh, this invariably had the had the ability had the fact of just churning up the seas or down off the south coast. So they were they were quite they were quite stormy. So any other storms that were coming through around that time um, had a, had a big impact on the on the the shipping in the area. Um, also, you you'll notice that if uh, anything running up uh, Bantry Bay, if it's a southwesterly or anything like that. It does make Bantry Bay very uncomfortable uh, to, to anchor in. Um, this wasn't the real, the real story at the time, although the Cowdown Bridge, she had about 160,000 tons of uh, riveted iron ore on, on board. There was another vessel there at that time. It was the Capo Emma. She was down at the, what you call it, she was uh, on a, on around the 18th, 19th of November, the Capo Emma was coming across uh, from from Canada, and uh, 
as I said, the weather, those depressions, she was traveling through the, through the Atlantic at that time, through the, the approaches, and uh, she lost a plate up for it, below the water line, somewhere up around number one, uh, up around, so she was taking water in. So she came into Bantry Bay uh, on the morning of the 19th, and uh, she, she called Valencia, she, tell, she told them that she was coming in, that she had a problem, and uh, they made contact with the, the Marine Survey Office up in Dublin. And uh, she, was, she did right, she came down. The Marine Surveyor sent a surveyor down, and uh, she was laden with approximately 89,000 tonnes of crude oil. So the surveyor came down, uh, they got on board the, the ship superintendent, they got a Lloyd's uh, surveyor across and they looked at her and uh, they decided, so they brought down pollution control equipment um, and they decided to, they would offload uh, the crew on her. So they, they brought in another vessel. But before they could bring in another vessel, the Kowloon Bridge came across uh, around the, on the evening of the 18th. And she said she too had a problem. So she came in to anchor. Now the exact anchoring position of the Kowloon Bridge uh, in, isn't known or is there's nobody nobody is can put it on a chart yet at this stage. But she came in, but she was certainly to seaward, and she's about three and a half miles southwest of uh, Willy Island. So the the what you the Cabo Emo was further in and uh, the Kowloon Bridge was further out. But during the night, the weather went up force 9, force 10, so uh, the Kowloon Bridge was unable to hold her position uh, in the area and uh, the captain tried his best, you know, with steerage etc, but he had a big, big, uh, big vessel, and um, one familiar port, he didn't have a local pilot on board, so he made the decision that he was going to go to sea. So around 1800, 1900, he headed back out. He headed back out to sea. He just couldn't. He couldn't hold her. The anchors couldn't hold her in the in the area. So he headed out. So as she headed out uh, later that evening, they they started to detect cracks on the top of the vessel, on the on the on the, the vessel. Um, around ten o'clock, sorry, eleven o'clock, she made a call to Valencia to say that uh, they heard a loud bang up for it, the vessel went into a trough, loud bang, vessel, big explosion, too rough to, to send anybody up so they couldn't see it. Around 11 o'clock after the explosion, they made a call to Malin Head to say that they needed assistance, oh, sorry, not Malin Head, they made a call to Valencia to say that they needed assistance. So, that was fine, the, the dead, they were still, still going. At, Half past, obviously, uh, they made this, uh, the call went into Valencia. Then around 20 past, the, the, what you call it, the, the made the decision, the captain made the decision uh, that he was going to abandon ship. So he informed Valencia he was going to abandon ship. Valencia had taken the precaution that uh, when they got the call at 11 o'clock that she needed assistance, they had radioed across to, uh, to Wales, uh, to the RAF, and uh, the RAF had sent over, were sending over two helicopters and an Imrod. So they arrived on scene at about half one that evening, or in the morning, and uh, the air lifted the crew off. So the captain set the, the vessel down on a course uh, southwest, two to three knots, and we know what happened next. She turned, came in underneath the stags, and she, uh, she uh, what do you call it, she sunk underneath the stags. On it. But the, the thing was, this was the story in the newspapers. Uh, it was all about the Kowloon Bridge. But the big, the big uh, environmental disaster that would have happened would have been if the Capital Emma had lost her cargo of 90,000 tonnes of, of crude. However, the ecological disaster would have been if 90,000 tonnes had ended up uh, off the coast in Bantry. I'll show you this. Uh, this slide, just to show you, in the early days of uh, 2000, what oil pollution exercises and uh, <coughs> what would happen within the local authorities, because we were in the in 2000, we were uh, we were and the local authorities were were we weren't at the races, uh, and we've come a long way from that. 
that's our, that, 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 that side of it. Just to show you that the Coast Guard, we don't always get it right either. I'm not too sure whether the, if the lights were a little lower or stuff like that, but that's the Elsinore. She's a French fishing vessel that went up. Uh, just on, just in the Blackhead, um, Galway Bay area. I'm not too sure what you can see, but just in front of the uh, the trawler, there is a boom. You might see it. It's the yellow the limp thing that's hanging around, the, or an orange thing, orange that's hanging around just in front of the, the vessel. Totally useless. You can see the what you call it. You can see the oil uh, seeping out around underneath the boom, etc. Uh, we, don't, we, we, we were learning very much on the job ourselves uh, on it. Uh, the one thing that was the one thing that would that I would say when when I look at that for ourselves is activity. There's no there's nobody watching apart from the guy who was on the up on the hillside taking a photograph. You know there isn't a boat down there managing it. There is nobody managing that in, that incident. You know what are we doing looking at that ourselves? You know so we look at that as a learning point for ourselves. And, you know, so we got that one completely, completely wrong. Let's go back. Let's go on to something that we need a little, little bit better. Uh, this Celestial Dawn 2002. Um, another batch of bad weather coming out. Uh, February the 14th, 2002. I always know this one because it's my wife's birthday on the on the February the 14th, and I always uh, I got the phone call that this was happening, and she was not best pleased when I left home that morning uh, on it. But um, Jeff Livingston was the, the deputy director at the time, and he was the guy who was in charge of this. And uh, so there was four. Spanish fishing vessels that were anchored in uh, Dingle, or sorry, not anchored, but they were alongside Dingle Harbour uh, in February 2002, shouting from the weather. They got a break in the weather. They decided to head to sea. So they trundled out beyond uh, the, what you call it, uh, the head, Dingle Lighthouse there. Three of them turned to starboard. One guy decided he turned to port for the last way in the line. For some unexplainable reason, he wanted to go to port. He went to port up on the rocks there. You can see, uh, looking at the side, right, there was a crew of uh, 15 on board at the time. The Shannon helicopter, uh, what you call it, uh, came down. Uh, we had, there was an RLI boat and the uh, Coast Guard, the Dingle Coast Guard boat was there. They couldn't get, they couldn't get close enough because of the weather situation. They, they, neither, the, the, neither the boats could get in. Um, they were, if the helicopter couldn't do the job, they were going to to do, try and uh, let the Coast Guard boat back uh, by line to try and get in, but even then, that was at a very, that was a very, uh, it would have been a risky maneuver. But you can see the, the watch collars, you can see the, how close to the actual cliff face, uh, it, the wind would have been blowing up right onto the cliff. So it was an exceptional bit of uh, pilotage from uh, the, the helicopter. Took off 15 people off it, um, and a marvellous bit of work. Do you know, I must be one of those weirdos, because whenever the situation gets dangerous, I get interested. And I've always been like that. And so, I've, for example, at Den Helder, I used to walk in, in Holland, and I'd walk in to the ops room, and if the weather was good, you know, if the weather was nasty, then I would say, way, this is a great day to go flying. And they used to think that I was that crazy British uh, come up from. <laughs> it was only happy when the weather was bad. Yeah. But, you know, that's just the way it is. <laughs> Very often you, you go off and rescue somebody and you're not actually saving a life, although at the time you don't know it. Very often you're giving somebody a lift to hospital, which they find very uh, quite agreeable because they're getting to hospital sooner than they otherwise would have done and they're getting expert medical attention earlier. But you're not actually saving their life because when you find out later, because you ring up the hospital and say, how is our patient doing? They'll say, yeah, he's fine. Um, would he have died if we hadn't rescued him? Oh, no. No, he would have been fine. <laughs> Uncomfortable, but alive. So very rarely do you have absolute concrete proof that you saved a life. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. But a few years ago, there was one job which does stand out because it was the Celestial Dawn. And this trawler, at the entrance to Dingle Harbour, was upside down. 
there were, was it 11 men, 10 men? I've made a note of it here. 10 men. 10 men who were clinging to the upturned hull. The Valencia lifeboat was there. I think he'd also, he'd either come over or he'd been there already. I'm not quite sure. But he tried to get the men off and couldn't get close to it because um, the seas were so horrendous and they were just smacked. Uh, and, uh, and these men were not going to let go anyway. So uh, we got called out, we got there, and the weather was really... So we did our little thing, and we rescued the ten men, and it was quite difficult for the winchman. So the winchman went down, and normally speaking, you would, if you had multiple survivors, the winchman would come off the hook, and he'd send, the, he'd send pairs up. That's the quickest way to do it. So he went down with two strops, uh, he'd come off the hook, put one strop on one survivor, one strop on the other, winch two of them up at a time, and that was the quickest way to get them out of danger. But on this occasion, there was no way the winchman would c could come off the hook because the whole area was being washed with huge waves all the time. So these men would disappear under a wave, and then they'd reappear with we'd count them, of course, there's still ten there. And we had, therefore, to keep the winchman on the hook. We would have lost him otherwise. Um, and send, he would do a double lift then with each man coming up one man at a time. So the winchman went up and down each time, and each time he brought a different survivor. And he did that ten times, and he was absolutely magnificent. And on each occasion, he had to convince the guy to let go, because all these fishermen, I've never met a fisherman yet that doesn't have a vice-like grip. But we got all ten on board took them to uh, Kerry Airport. There's a fleet of ambulances there. The weather was so bad we couldn't get them to Trilly Hospital, which was the normal place, because the cloud base was right on the deck. And um, and all ten were taken to hospital and all, they were all safe. And I can guarantee 100% that nobody else was going to... The cliff rescue team was there as well. They couldn't do anything. If we hadn't winched those guys off, they would be dead, because they were literally on their last legs and they were not going to make it and the only way possible to get them off was by helicopter so on that occasion and probably the only occasion in how many times i've been on search and oh, I don't know, over 22 years of my flying has been on search and rescue and that's probably the only occasion i can say definitely we saved 10 lives oh that area up around the top uh, is a natural walkway um, just to show you what, ha what happened is uh, we put a major bit of work into, into managing that incident. Why? Fungi. All right? Natural, what you call it. If fungi had been lost at that time, I'm not sure what, which fungi were on, Mark 5, 6, 7, or 8 at this stage. But if fungi had been lost at that site, whether it was Mark 1 or 6, where it would have been, uh, what you call it, it would, we would have uh, faced a, a major, major problem. I told you about the, the walkway. You can see Bob the Builder. We had to build a roadway in to, to, manage, to manage that. Um, we had to come across some farmer's land. Uh, that took a bit of negotiation and it took a bit of compensation as well uh, to, get at, to get that access because we had to widen the, the watch colours. And we had, when it was all finished, we had to restore the land back to its original feature. So we, re we rented, the, that, or rented the, the section off them at the time. The top end becomes a bit of a, a, bit of a building site. Uh, this area is just beside the, that, uh, what you call it, the, the, lighthouse, the lighthouse area you see. First thing we did was we put in rock anchors. You can see the, the blue lines coming up from the, the vessel to stop it slipping down. So basically, yeah, we cut a trench, we put in uh, uh, heavy steel girders, and we put in, we put what you call it, we put the lines up from the vessel, tied them taut, infill with rock, and then infill with uh, land on top, or sorry, with uh, soil on top of that, just to, to keep them in, uh, keep them in place. What happens then is we we sort of then we got uh, we got uh, what. Which company was Smith Tack? Yeah, Smith, where they, they were awarded the contract uh, to to do the salvage work. So they came across, they came in with uh, the flew equipment into Farm 4, brought it down. 
uh, we had to have a couple of uh, pumps on the, the top, of, uh, top of it and basically what happened is you can see the two guys I'm not too sure how clearly you can see them just on this one you can see the two guys working away uh, so all the fuel, all the bunkers, all the bits and pieces they all have to be taken off first so the, to render the vessel like, just like a, a, a hook or a, a shell to take that off um, so they had to go down, we had to, you had to get divers in down into the engine room you had to bring that pipe or sections of that pipe in to, to suck, the, suck it out it was sucked out, you can see it was brought up as far as uh, the slurry tank, you can see the settling tank, we set, we set the water there and then whatever oil was then pumped into the, uh, into the slurry tank taken away for, for disposal now that took about approximately three weeks and then the weather turned bad again so it was left and then we had to go back then for salvage so and that was in February, April February to April, yeah and then in September we did the, we did the bit, the lift off we took half a ton of oily water all right, off it so having said that then the next thing was the removal of the wreck uh, we, the shear legs came across from, uh, from Holland uh, there was a barge came over and then a small tug you can see the, just in between the two gantries there is uh, two black dots, that is the barge and uh, a tug and basically what happens is the shear legs went in put it out, lift up, lift up the vessel the barge comes in, you put the, you put the barge on top and then it was taken into ventry we put all the old oily equipment or uh, bits and pieces into the into the vessel, and then the vessel was taken away to Germany for disposal on it. And that whole operation cost approximately a million, million euro on the thing between the oil and and stuff like that. Okay. Um, Princess Eva, one that uh, we we got reasonably good international coverage on. Um, you will remember that the prestige and uh, happened prior to this. Um, what happened was there was a, a crew member in, injured on the on this vessel. She came in. She deposited the crew member, and then we uh, what to call it. Uh, inspectors from the Marine Survey Office went out. They found cracks on the vessel, so uh, the vessel was taken around to uh, to St John's Point, Donegal Bay and uh, it was offloaded, the, the cargo was offloaded into another vessel and then that vessel was taken around to Dublin and uh, she was, uh, she was uh, what you call it, she had some ship repairs done to her um, this is what you call it, this was, uh, this was reckoned to be good management we got reasonably good uh, publicity, international publicity on it because we were sort of seen to be taking a proactive approach to managing major incidents and to be, to, to, uh, to be taken on board as a maritime country to actually to be intervening and to ensure that safe shipping uh, was, was taking place. Um, most of the spills that happened are minor spills, you can see that's a diesel spill that happened down in Dunmore East. Uh, it's what you call it, in the, it's a typical problem uh, on it, but you can see the, it is like diesel oil that, that is going to burn off uh, in time uh, not much action there happening because there's a very low wave energy at the, at the minute um, and not a huge amount of sunlight you can see that the, the what you call it not a huge amount of sunlight at that time but it, it will take a bit of time the only problem that has is that you know fishermen think it's, it's grand to do this or you know certain people think it's, it, that's fine but they, it damages the other boats, you know, and it also makes it, you know, in, a, in an area like Dunmore East, where a town which is trying to uh, encourage youngsters to get out in the water, youngsters to get out sailboarding, you know, and you're trying to encourage, uh, you know, tourists to get out to come out, they're not going to come out if they're going to have that sort of problem, okay? The horizon. Another one, another vessel that went up in the rocks just off Donegal. She's still there. Any reason why? Can't get at it. I can get at it. 
Jews can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> We've got big shear legs. <laughs> no, no. It's flow remote. Nobody cares. Nobody watches. Nobody goes up there. Unlike the one in Dingle, unlike the one in Dingle, where people are walking up and down and by it morning, noon, and night, and people would say that's a nice old get that out of there. Nobody goes by this one, so it's still there. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been following the BBC News and stuff like that. The uh, Kuznetskov, she's gone down to uh, she's gone down to the Mediterranean. The Kuznetskov fleet, there's a it's a cruiser fleet. Uh, Putin has sent uh, that one down there now to for Syria to the war in Syria. Uh, she she popped up on the Irish coast. She doesn't pop up on her own. Normally, when the, something like an, air, an aircraft carrier travels, it will have a. It'll have two or three escort vessels, it'll have uh, bunker vessels, it'll have a number of aircraft flying overhead, and it'll have a couple of submarines with it. And of course, if the Russians are doing that, you can be damn sure that the British or the Americans on the other side, they have got two or three vessels <coughs> shadowing this group as well. So quite a busy time out there. Um, we got a report, and I will refer you back to the EMSA, the EMSA report back in, uh, that we talked about earlier on. And uh, she was refueling at night, and uh, someone fell asleep. <laughs> someone fell asleep, that's all I can tell you. Uh, other than that, they said they lost uh, 50 ton of, uh, of Muzan oil, which is a heavy crude. <coughs> could be more, it could be more. Um, the British estimated that it was somewhere like 300 tons, um, but that was. Obviously, they're going to have their side of it. We estimated it was somewhere around about <coughs> 75, 80 tons uh, on it. So, somewhere, in, somewhere between all three figures, that is the truth. Um, that's what it turns to uh, on it. Uh, that's, why, that's after uh, three or four days. Uh, you can see it's starting to boost there at that stage. Uh, water is starting to ingrain and it's starting to collect. And it, it, next, what will happen is it'll start to uh, take the, the wind trails. It'll start to go through it and it'll start to come out like slivers uh, on it. Some of it with all oils, there'll be light ends on it and a lot of it will evaporate. You can see the wave energy there, uh, there's not a lot of wave energy to, to break up that oil at this stage on it. Um, it was about 50 miles off the coast. Uh, we activated our emergency plans. We had set up a centre down below in uh, down in Ross Lair. We had brought the local councils together. Uh, our SAR map, our oil maps, uh, they, sorry, our, our, our oil maps showed that uh, it would come a, come ashore somewhere around uh, the sort of the east of Cork, uh, around Waterford, and up maybe a small bit up to Arco. So we had brought all the local authorities in there. We had identified the areas, and we had started to uh, we started to mobilise the stockpiles to to move them out onto the coast. Uh, we didn't do it because we were waiting to see uh, where the what you call it, where the where where it was happening. It disappeared after about uh, after about four weeks. None of us came near the coast for some reason. Maybe um, the interesting thing is it would be interesting just to dive or if divers went down just to see if there was anything on the on the, the ocean floor or anything like that left at this stage. Right. As we can see, uh, we have been Ireland has been very lucky in relation to major oil pollution. However, uh, in conjunction with the North Sea, uh, we are finding that probably ships casualty and major casualty events are not going to be the uh, oil pollution events that we that we're planning for at the minute. But it's probably going to be something like this. This is a container vessel, the, the BG Dublin in 2010. And you can see the way some of the containers are stacked on it. And you can see how precariously they're, they're stacked. And you might say, well look, that's grand. Uh, sure look, two or three containers go missing and you know, that's not on it. We had one, we one ship the Maersk, uh, one of the Maersk line, through the Bay of Biscay two years ago. And uh, she travelled through uh, Force A, Force 9 storm. And uh, when she got to her port in uh, what you call it, in the south, the south of France, she had discovered that she had lost 530 odd containers. 
530 odd. Now that will tell you uh, the, the sort of the man management or the, the, the freight management that's going on. Where the, where the ship's crew were at the time. And that, you can see that that's a, an indication of the industry, you know, that the, the what you call it, to lose that. The French authorities were very quick on the ball. Uh, they have identified and they brought in Maersk were very cooperative, um, because the French can be very uh, tough. Uh, Maersk were cooperative, they, and they did bring in ROVs, and they found two large pods. They have identified or found about 300 and 350 odd of the containers of the 500 that are there and stuff like that, so they seem happy enough with that at this stage. Uh, plants and all, <coughs> uh, you, anyone been to the Iron Islands? Yep, and you've been over there, so you remember the ferries that would go from Rossville across, mm -hmm. right, uh, about 2011, they were replaced. And the older, the older vessels, the two older vessels were, uh, what you call it, were due to be taken out. This vessel, the Pantanal, right, she, she got the contract. Now she came into Galway Bay and it was uh, south, south uh, easterly and uh, she went to anchor in uh, Rossaville. The harbour master in Rossaville said, Captain, that would not be a particularly good idea. The captain said, I don't mind. I'm going to do it anyway, so he did, and uh, next thing, his anchors didn't work, and you can see he ended up on the on the what you call it, on the other side of the of, the, of uh, Rossaville. Uh, she was what you call it. She wasn't pulled, wasn't breached, or anything like that, and it took about two days to get her out of there. Uh, the, right, the Flaminia, a German flag vessel. Uh, the alarm went off. And uh, they went through the went through normal routine. The uh, crew mustered. Then they went out and uh, they sent the vessel. They sent the crew down to have a look. And uh, when the crew were mustering in their area and getting ready to go, there was a massive explosion. Now we go back in. This this falls back into our places of refuge or our ports of refuge. Um, we got a, a request or a, what you call it. A telephone call just to say, look, this has happened. We need a port. We need somewhere to come in. And um, we went through the normal procedure. Uh, tell us what's on board. They couldn't tell us what's on board. They didn't have an up-to-date manifest or anything like that. They couldn't tell us the damage. Um, the crew, after about uh, after uh, two days, were taken off, um, and int intermittently. Uh, Smith's crew were out there fighting the fire, putting it in, uh, trying to manage the situation. It took them about a month or so to get the fire completely out. Uh, and there are a number of reasons, there are, sorry, there are about five possible reasons as to why the explosion took place. A uh, number of things out of, out of it uh, show that the CO2 system as well it was not it was it was connected incorrectly so that when you pushed it on it went off and when you pushed it off it went on um, and that, they didn't discover that till, till actually during the fire now uh, the vessel made its way uh, we got the request by the time they got the manifesto uh, together to give us um, the vessel had sort of moved on and it, had it, made, it, was, it was moving up towards the, the English coast and it was off the, 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 the south coast of the UK. The biggest problem we have, and we do, we, we do take this into account when if something like this does happen, first of all, if we brought that into a port, we would tie up the whole port. You wouldn't get anything else done in the port uh, on it. Germany, were, Germany, the final place where they went to, uh, Cruxhaven, it had a new part, a new area which was completely, uh, hadn't been commissioned yet, and so they were able to take this and, and do all the work on it. Um, in the UK, they had identified a place of refuge on it for it. They were going to take it in and put it on the south coast, uh, but it would have been burning away for a few, few weeks, a few months, before they get the fire under control. You can see that some of the some of that uh, area, how difficult it would be to start trying to take those uh, containers off. 
There is no vessels, there is no ready-made machinery. There are no cranes out there at the minute that we can actually start to do this sort of work uh, very easily uh, on it. So you have to take that into account that, uh, you know, it is going to need, it would need to be managed realistically in a, what you call it, in a port, port environment uh, on it. So it was, uh, what you call it, the reason I'd say that is because this is, in my opinion, this is going to be the, what you call it, this is going to be where we have the problem. This is the MV Rena. This was a vessel with 1,360 odd containers on, on board. Um, she she went up on a, she went up about on a atoll down in uh, what you call it down in uh, New Zealand. Um, you can see when I said most of our vessels operate on our coast are sub 2,000 TEUs. So you would see that. Uh, this is quite conceivably a similar situation that's going to happen off our coast. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the containers taken off, but it does take time. That sort of heavy equipment, all these, these ships and stuff like that, they had, New Zealand had its, what you call it, they had uh, their own, oil, they had their own oil carrier, which they could send in to take this out. Uh, it took the bunkers uh, and fuel off the, off the arena. However, the lifting equipment, that had to come from Singapore. It took about three weeks to get down there. It takes time to manufacture, or sorry, not to manufacture, but it takes time to put together all that equipment, if it's available. Okay? So it took the best part of 12 months to get all the containers off. Meanwhile, the ship broke its back, and a lot of the containers end up exactly like you see on the beaches. It took about two years to gather all that equipment and bits and pieces uh, on it. The ship was broken up, or parts of the ship were taken off, the, woods, the bits that were above the surface, and each pit was taken off by helicopter. Very expensive way of doing it, but uh, the, what you call it, the reason for that was because this was a holy place. This was a Maori special area of conservation, and this was the way the Maoris wanted to do this done. Uh, on it. Uh, a lot of the companies that did that work, you can see that it is not one company in New Zealand that's going to do it. A lot of the companies come from all over the world to, uh, to, to manage these incidents, to, to provide equipment expertise, etc., to do this sort of work on it. And that's what I'd say to you guys and ladies, is that this is probably what is going to happen to Ireland. New Zealand at the time had seven oil pollution officers. It now has 14. The UK has 17 people in its pollution and solvent section. Norway has 60 people in its pollution and solvent section. Ireland has one. Right? And that's the point I really want to make to you tonight. On it. On it. Media v reality. Uh, the media will focus in the oil spill, they will focus in on the, 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 the birds, the wildlife, etc. But it is really, if it, we do have an oil spill, or we do have a container spill, it is going to be the grunt work. It is going to be the poor, poor individual out like that, scraping up the heavy oil, etc. So it is a bunch of colours. It is not always what you read. And I hope that some of the stuff I told you in relation to the incidents, uh, it's not always what you read in the, in the media.